Hello everybody, welcome back to Find My Paths From Home, the free family history series designed with all of you in mind. So wherever you're joining us from today, whatever you're up to, I hope you're having a fantastic day. Spring is in the air, we've got blossom on the trees, you know, the, the temperature is uh, it's finally climbing up a little bit, I think. Though in Edinburgh, you know, we had 15 degrees last week and it's eight degrees today, so it's just, it just varies so much. My name is Ellie, I'm Senior Community Executive for Find My Past. And today we are very, very pleased to welcome back a returning guest to Find My Past from home. We have, and I'm about to add her into the stream, so I hope she's ready. Um, we've got Dr. Kate Strasden of Falmouth University. Welcome back, Kate. Thanks, Ellie, it's so lovely to be back. I, it's, it's just great to, um, I know we're all stuck indoors a lot of the time still but even so it's great to do these kind of events so thanks for having me it's a pleasure to have you on thank you so much for taking the time because you've actually had quite a busy last week or so I say week it's only the last week that you've actually submitted but you've actually um finished a book yes so it went to the publisher last when so literally a week ago um book that I've been writing for 16 months practically every day um so yeah it feels like although now I'm a bit bereft oh, oh. What do I do with myself? <laughs> <laughs> family history <laughs> now let's welcome a couple of people who are appearing in the comments let's have a look and see who we've got today we've got Daphne tuning in from a damp Somerset we've got Linda uh, from Nottinghamshire we've got Victoria from a sunny Suffolk I'm glad it's sunny with you <laughs> We've got Ellen from Roscoe, Illinois. Karen from a grey looking London. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm wanting the sun to come out a little bit, please. <laughs> right, we've got lots of you today, fantastic. Now, just to let you know, um, Kate will be taking some questions towards the end if we've got time. So if you do have a question about fashion history, because that's what we're gonna be talking about today. Um, Kate is a, a, you know, she's a fashion historian by trade. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to do some questions towards the end. So if you do have a question about fashion history or using family history resources for fashion history, please pop it into the comments. If you could put question at the beginning, that will make it a little bit easier for me to find. Um, now, Kate, you're, you're a senior lecturer at Falmouth University. You are a fashion historian. But um, tell us a little bit about yourself, um, about, about your career. How have you got to this point? Well, I started out as a volunteer. I always knew that I really loved the idea of historic dress. And I, I ever since I was very young, actually, and I can't remember, I got this because I can't remember if I showed this to you before, but anybody that um, anybody that didn't see last time or hadn't seen, this is, this is something I collected when I was seven. And these were the Brook Bond tea cards. My granny used to buy Brook Bond tea and the cards used to come in each packet of tea. And this was the series on British costume. And each week you got a different card um, or, or a collection of cards. And then you would stick them into the, you would send off for the book and stick the cards in. Um, and I got this when I was, I collected these from about the age of seven and I just loved them. I gave them all names, all of the characters in there. and found the idea of what people used to wear just completely fascinating and so I started out as a volunteer in a museum when I was 19 and I would really recommend anyone that's interested in um, that kind of of how you start to learn more about if you're really interested in that um, I volunteered for a couple of years at a museum and learned an awful lot about um, about dress history about objects about how you date things um, and then I went to uni to study history, um, did my master's in the, uh, it was a master's in the history of textiles and dress at Winchester School of Art. And then I did my um, my doctorate at the University of Southampton. Um, and from there, it uh, went down an academic route, but I've always been really interested in how objects tell stories. And I think that's where a lot of my research takes me. It starts with the objects or, um, the way people dressed and then how that tells stories. Amazing. Um, Niall is in the comments, so please say hello to him. He'll be firing links if you need them, everybody. Um, one of which uh, I'd like him to share is a link to Kate's Instagram account, which I cannot, I cannot recommend enough. It is just fantastic. So please go and give her a follow and have a look through some of the 
incredible examples of historical dress throughout the ages that she shares. So definitely go and check that out. Something else for me to point out as well before we get started properly is over on Find My Past this weekend. So from 10 o'clock on Friday morning UK time to 10 o'clock on Monday uh, UK time, uh, we're doing free access to census records. So it's British census records and you can just go and have a look. You can look at your family, you can look at your streets, you can look up the history of your house. Um, really, really exciting. So definitely give that a try if you are a little bit bereft for something to do this weekend. So um, have we have we missed anything about yourself, uh, Kate? Um, do you have a particular era of historical dress that is maybe your favourite? I I think the nineteenth century is something that I would that have always been really interested in because it, the the scope is so huge. You've got the the change of silhouette with the with the Regency and the those very slim. Um, early 19th century uh, styles at the at the beginning um, you've got all of that I think I just love the the way that technology then drove a really fast pace of change so you get to something like the 1820s 1830s and and the silhouette has changed completely again it's it's not just slight subtle changes but it's a, a real revolution in in the cycle of fashion and then you get to the 50s and 60s where, again, technology like sprung steel technology means that cage crinolines are much lighter and much more flexible than, say, the petticoats that had been worn before. It moves into dye technologies with all of the synthetic dyes. And it's just that sense of, um, of inquiry and industry and the fast pace of things really influencing how um how people chose to dress I do it's women's wear that I'm particularly um always been particularly interested in rather than men's wear I'm I know I'm sure men's wear is very interesting but it's just never quite <laughs> <the right. laughs> and particularly 19th century I think although there is a bit of a, a bit of a I think it's a bit of an urban myth that men's wear is always boring in the 19th century um because there were lots of different things going on, perhaps a bit more subtly. But yes, I tend to uh, I tend to stick with women's wear in particular. And then, of course, you get to the end of the century, and it's starting to head towards that Edwardian uh, exuberance, and there's just so much there. So yeah, the nineteenth century is probably where I'm most at home. I think. Yeah, and I was watching a little bit of a TV program the other night, and they were talking about. Um, moustaches for men and how um I, I can't remember exactly what they said but it was something like um originally men didn't really have moustaches and then they had to have them in the military because apparently it displayed um you know masculinity and, and power and things like that and then yeah. that reminded me of the fact that I saw you on tv the other night on um oh, on the Edward the seventh um, Edward the seventh the playboy prince yeah. yes yeah yeah is it um they are going to, I think they're going to make a companion programme to that actually about Queen Alexandra because that's where my area yeah, was. Yeah, I was going to say, yes. Um, so I did my doctorate, uh, I completed it in 2013. I did it part time because I had a toddler and a baby at home at the time. Uh, so I did it part time and I was looking at the surviving garments of Queen Alexandra. And when I was a volunteer at the, at the, museum and then actually got a job there when I was about 24 um, we were given these garments that were these very over-the-top Edwardian evening gowns about six of them that um, it sort of relates to family history in a way in that uh, some people had bought a new house uh, bought a house and it was an old Victorian villa and when they were clearing out the attic that the previous owners had left behind there was a trunk in there that was full of clothes and usually we we would get phone calls like saying oh we found we found we've got some things we'd like to to give to your collection and they're they're ordinarily perhaps not especially exciting but these were six Edwardian gowns really beautiful and they all had a maker's label in them which was John Redfern and John Redfern was a really important British dressmaker in the late 19th and early 20th century. 
and I started to do a bit of research into that particular fashion house and the picture or the, the character that cropped up frequently uh, in that uh, in relation to John Redfern was Queen Alexandra and she was one of his big patrons and so that took me on a path of thinking well she she looks really I was just fascinated by the photographs of her and I was curious about whether any of her clothes had survived and then that became the subject of my of my PhD which was trying to find um, all around the world and they are literally all around the world the various locations of her surviving garments and then virtually reuniting them to think about what clothes can tell you about a person when they're no longer there what what could we read into somebody from their from their the clothes that they left behind absolutely i think this is something we talked about last time the fact that there are very there, there are a lot of different um aspects to a person to your ancestor and one of those is you know the, the clothes that they wore and how how that shaped you know their 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 career their job if they had one you know there's just there's just so much extra detail and color that we can we can uncover if we you know if we've got old photographs of our ancestors you know have they been done in a studio are they sort of a little bit more staged what are they wearing? Why are they wearing what they're wearing? There's so many little clues that you can get out and, of these. And I'm really, uh, it's it's difficult, isn't it? Because I think in many ways we're encouraged to be very um, Murray Kondo about things now that it's all about minimalism and that we shouldn't hoard things and that we should uh, that we should clip. But of course, it's it's thanks to our ancestors hoarding things and keeping those collections of ephemeral bits and pieces or keeping their clothes that allows us that window into uh into their world and their lives so um i'm all for a bit of hoarding absolutely my mum's still got her her wedding dress and i don't think myself nor my sisters will fit into it because she's she's about she's a lot shorter than the, than the rest of us but uh but yes um what so we talked we talked about favorite era what about trends is there a particular trend that you're quite keen on i do um i do love an interesting sleeve and one of the things that i that i find very interesting in the 19th century is the the uh the way that they because cloth was so much more valuable than the way we value textiles today the idea of making a garment adaptable and there are all sorts of you can see in collections dresses that are really ingenious in the way that they have been so you might get for example a dress that has a detachable sleeve but the sleeve it's just very cleverly hook, hooks and eyes so it looks it's not an obvious um attachment so you have what looks like a long sleeve bodice but then it can be unhooked and you've got something that you can wear in the evening or you have um, you have a skirt, but two different, two or even three different bodices that go with that skirt. So you can either wear it during the day, you can wear it for dinner, you can wear it to a party. So that ingeniousness of dress, because you had to value the textiles that you had, is something that I really find interesting. And and I think it's coming back around again. I think as we are having to be more mindful about how um how we use clothes there are there are designers who are who are thinking along those lines of adaptability or um some kind of ingenious way of using it that using the past to actually take some good notes on on best practice is always really interesting fabulous now i do we do we do have a little game to play with you all actually but before we do that i'm worried that the first questions that we've had will get lost with the answers to the game so if, you're, if it's all right with you kate can we do the first yeah, couple of questions cool. first so I've, we've had a couple through i'm just scrolling to to find what have i done with these okay question from susan I'm very interested in the British Regency period. Where in Britain would I find the best collection of Regency dress? Well, hi, Susan. So we are very lucky in the UK in that there are uh, a number of collections that will have, obviously the V&A has a great collection of, um, of all periods, 
from the from the 17th 18th century onwards but their store is closing for a little while not the museum itself but the actual uh, study facility because they're moving however you have places like the fashion museum in bath that have a fantastic collection uh, you uh, and that connection with jane austen means that they are they are often um uh keen to promote that side of their collections uh the museum of london have got a really lovely exhibition um uh, which is called the Pleasure Gardens, which is based on the Vauxhall Gardens, and they've they've set it up so it looks like uh, people from Regency parading through the Vauxhall Pleasure Gardens in the early nineteenth century. It's amazing. Uh, you've got places like Platt Hall in Manchester has an, a brilliant collection. Lot you will find most collection most town museums will have um, a collection of costume, and they may well have. Um, Regency, but yeah, I would say V and A, um, Bath, Manchester—they're probably the big ones. Amazing! I love, it's, I, I, we spoke about this last time, but it's always something that whenever we go to a museum, I go to a museum with my mum. That's always the bit that she goes to—is the fashion bit. Yes, yeah, just something about it. Uh, Victoria saying, "I love Kate's Insta." Oh, thank you, Victoria. Yeah. Question from Sue. I have photos of my family in Ireland, 1860 to 1890. Do you know what colours they would have been wearing? Sue, they would have been really bright. I think that is the other thing to remember about the 19th century. When we're very used to seeing those photographs that are by, because of the technology are in those sorts of sepia shades and no one's smiling because of the long exposure time. <laughs> Uh, and so you couldn't smile in a photograph because it, you would have had to hold it for too long. And so it, I think the perception is of these black and white stern Victorians. 1856 is when uh, William Perkins, who was the, a chemist, young chemist, uh, accidentally discovered uh, he was working on a, um, an experiment with coal tar to synthesize quinine for malaria. And accidentally discovered that the the residue from the, the experiment that he was making created this bright bright purple color and purple had notoriously been a really difficult color to fix to cloth and so he patented it and it became all the rage so all through the 1850s and 60s you get these bright synthetic dyes that had been very difficult to create before so bright purples and um, bright greens which was often created using white arsenic and so actually very toxic uh, bright blues there's there's a real vibrancy to to that whole second half of the 19th century lots of pattern uh, so I think it they would be surprisingly bright even cheaper fabrics were very brightly colored so um, yeah they would have been vivid brilliant um, yeah I mean I, I completely agree I mean sometimes you often you look at these photographs of and they're black and white or they're sepia and you look and they're just sort of looking there and they're quite, they're quite dour. You, you almost imagine them to be wearing brown and black. And Yeah, yeah. it's surprising. They will have, they will have been much, much, um, much, much brighter than we imagine. Um, okay, a uh, question from Linda. And this goes into our game that we're going to play, actually. How accurately can a photo be dated if you have no information about it at all? So, Linda, the, the, the beauty of the 19th century, on the one hand, is that because the pace of change was so swift, it's it's actually, you can identify periods quite easily because um, a sleeve from the early 1840s is different from a sleeve from the late 1840s, and so it goes on. So in that respect, it's easy to, um, it's easy to be quite specific. The only thing you have to remember with, with photographs is that not everybody keeps up with the pace of fashion at the same time. So you might have somebody who is buying clothing on the secondhand market and they might pick up a dress secondhand that was at the in its first flush of fashion, say four or five years before, and then they're wearing it for a bit longer. So you have to sometimes give it that, um, that sort of wiggle room where you can date the garment quite accurately, but the person wearing it might have been wearing it for a bit longer or it might be a bit later. So you just have to bear that in mind. 
I suppose it's a little bit like today if if we see photographs in a glossy a glossy glossy fashion magazine of models wearing the latest fashions and then you know that takes you know six months to a year to actually hit the high street and the stores and then you know you could be picking things up second hand years and years later exactly. Um, lovely. Right, a couple more, if that's all right. Uh, question from Victoria. Which historical garment had the most effect on you and why? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think because I was so invested in studying Queen Alexandra's wardrobe for such a long time, I, I studied it for the best part of a decade and then and then and then published a book about it. So um, when I was I. I came across some of her garments at the in the Royal Ontario Museum in Canada, and I spent a month in the in the museum there on on a research fellowship. And there was this amazing dress that belonged to Alexandra that seemed to defy everybody's expectations of it because when we fitted it onto a mannequin, it didn't fit properly, and it was really odd. We couldn't figure it out. It looked like it had been really badly made at the back. And it didn't make any sense because she was the queen. It's it's full on couture, very expensive. And I ended up contacting a curator who had others of her dresses. And she said, well, that's weird because none of ours fit properly either. It's it's something odd going on. And then I thought, OK, so what's happening with Alexandra? And, and I recalled that she had suffered from rheumatic fever when she was in her 20s following one of her pregnancies that left her with a limp. And it was a very well documented limp. Um, so I then contacted a paediatric um, uh, uh, orthopaedic surgeon and said, if someone's been limping from their 20s, what might be the impact on their on their body, particularly in a pre um, a pre modern medicine era? And he said, undoubtedly scoliosis, she would have had a curvature of the spine. Um, and of course, then this dress becomes really poignant because it had been made to fit her body, but also to disguise it because she didn't want anybody to know she was very cagey about that sort of thing um and so there was this dress that kind of revealed this previously unknown part of her life and that's i think what objects can do sometimes that's really quite moving the really? fact that you know, you 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 had all of these garments. They didn't they didn't fit the mannequins, and you're trying to figure out why. Why was that the case? And then suddenly you find out this quite intimate detail about this. And she wouldn't have wanted anybody to know. I did think sometimes when I was rifling through her things that she probably would have been horrified. But um, but yeah, it's a really it it was a mark of how today we celebrate difference, obviously, and we celebrate um, different bodies. But at that time, with Queen Victoria as a mother-in-law who was absolutely paranoid about ill health she was very she was very careful about making sure that this was something that nobody knew goodness all right let's see if we can squeeze in scott williams question here um is there an everyday fashion of an older period that kate thinks would be popular now especially as trends come and go um do you know william i think what i'm always really interested in and I quite often do this with my students because I teach fashion students and we talk about this idea of historicism being a, a, a constant cycle within uh within the fashion world and I think there are certain things that designers seem to come back to quite frequently I think that the empire line that sort of regency that often um that often makes a comeback um, I think what's interesting at the moment in a post-COVID world is whether there's going to be some kind of explosion of old world glamour again. I do wonder that, of, uh, certainly you've seen it after the First World War, you had 1920s where it was all about, um, you know, the extreme femininity and the, the beaded dresses and complete change. After the Second World War, you had the new look and the yards of fabric and uh, again, a complete reaction to rationing and everything that had come before. Um, and so there's quite a lot of discussion in the fashion press at the moment about whether there's going to be a similar a similar reaction in a post-pandemic world that we will all want to dress up just to go to the supermarket. 
Yeah. I do wonder. I, I, I feel like, you know, my, my sister, she's probably not watching. I hope she's not watching if I say this. Um, she She's the type of person that dresses up to go to the supermarket because it's the only time she gets to dress up and she absolutely loves her clothes. Um, so maybe we will see some kind of return to that sort of um, really old school glamour of that mid-century, mid-20th century period. Okay. Lovely. Thank you for your questions, everybody. Really good questions today. Um, what we're going to do next is we're going to play a little bit of an interactive game. So the idea with this is that I went and had a look in our newspapers and I love exploring those for images of fashions from times gone by. So I've pulled out five different images. And what I thought would be really fun is if you guess the decade. I'm not going to say the exact year, everybody. I'm going to say the decade. OK, um, and what we will we will do then is we'll pass over to, to Kate and you can maybe explain why. You know, the the the, the, the details that help us pinpoint. Yeah, the decade decade. That decade, yeah. yeah, so let me add my screen in here. OK, can I just ask as well, when you're guessing everybody, so I know which one you're guessing for, can you put the number? So each of these are numbered. We've got one, two, three, four and five. Put the number and then the decade. So this is the first one we're looking at. It's the, the description is two indoor dresses, simple costumes for everyday use. And then it goes into further detail about what, you know, massive detail, actually about what we're actually seeing here. Um, so Kate, I don't know whether you would like to elaborate now without giving the decade away or whether you'd like to do it afterwards. That is up well, to you. The only thing I would say at this point is that one of the interesting things about the way newspapers write about dress is this is at a point pre-colour in these kinds of reports. So people were really good at understanding it's this idea of material literacy. So when, she's, when it's writing there about petunia venetian cloth um talking about the pleated yoke and collar band of black moire um people reading that would have understood exactly what that meant they were very good at knowing what their textiles were what their um what their what the way that the fabric had been manipulated what trimmings so those really detailed descriptions kind of stand in for the fact that they haven't got color and people were just really good at understanding what they meant yeah, there are a lot of words in this description that I did not know what they were. <laughs> but um, yes, as, as, as you said, I'm sure those reading them would have would have known. And um, so we had a lot of guesses in the comments. We've got 1890s, 1700s, uh, 1900s, 1870s. Yes, lots here. Lots of guesses. Well done, everybody. Thank you for getting involved. OK, the correct answer for this one. And let me see if I can bring up a correct answer. Yvonne, you've got it right. It's the 1890s. So this is from the graphic in 1896. And what do we think? What, what do we think about what, what is it about this particular illustration? I think it's an illustration rather than a, rather yeah. than a photograph. What, how, how do we know that? OK, so the 1890s is really interesting because you can be quite specific. The early 1890s, um, you could date 1891, 1892 because they have a narrow sleeve, but just with a tiny upstanding puff, just like a little sort of um, a very small puff at the at the at the top. Um, it's the mid 1890s where you get that huge, as you can see there, the much larger what's called that, that leg of mutton sleeve um, or the gigo sleeve. So that dates it to the mid 1890s because come the end of the 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 end of the 1890s it goes back to a much tighter sleeve again. So if ever you're looking at photographs and you see a big sleeve like this with the big hair um, and then a gourd skirt. So by that I mean a skirt that's not pleated, um, as you can see here. Then that puts you bang in the middle of the 1890s. It's very specific. See, I was actually going to, when I first looked at this, I thought it might have been Edwardian, um, but I'm not right. And look at the size of that waist. Yeah. Yes. And of course, or, uh, every, uh, women are wearing corsets and um, that's just part of their everyday lived experience. OK, well done, everybody. Let's move on. Conscious of time. This is the second one. So when you put in guess, put number two at the beginning, please. So this is described as cashmere cloth 
making this attractive jumper suit. It is available both with and without the coat. It comes from the salons of Harvey Nichols in Knightsbridge. And this illustration was from the Illustrated Sporting and Dramatic News. But what is the decade, everybody? Kate, what do we think we're looking for here? What can you tell us? Well, of course, the silhouette is really important here. That makes a big difference. Um, it is uh, the fact that it's knitted. That's also very uh, distinctive. Um, that is particularly uh, relevant for this decade. Um, and the fact that it's a photograph of, as well, because actually, although photography had been around since the 1840s, it wasn't routinely used until much later as part of um, editorial in, in magazines and newspapers. Brilliant. Well, I think this one might have been too easy because I think we've got a lot of people guessing the 1920s. Well done, everybody. I hope you're all scoring your your, your points here. So, yeah, what what, it, what what is it about this particular image? It's that crop-waisted silhouette. It is the losing the waist for the first time, really, in, in women's wear, uh, where you've got this knitted suit. The knitted suit's really interesting. It was uh, Chanel, when Chanel started to design women's wear in the early 20th century, um, and then in post-World War One, she didn't have very much money. And so the only cloth that she could get hold of was knitted jersey, which traditionally had been used for uh, men's underwear. And so she started to make these natty two-piece suits, a bit like you can see here, out of knitted, uh, knitted jersey. And they just, it just took off and they were huge. Uh, and so that's what makes this that's one of the other way, ways that helps you date this period. The hat then, of course, the hair, that shingled um, bob and the Mary Jane shoes. Those are the other things that are really uh, specific to that kind of with the little Louis heel. That's very specific to the 20s. Fantastic. Um, Shauna just asking, uh, she said she tuned in late. So these fashions for the Great Brit for Great Britain or for the US too. They're from British newspapers. But there was a real there's, there is a crossover. So at the, certainly in the 19th and early 20th century, right up till the Second World War, um, wealthy American clients would shop in Europe. And so there's um, there's still there's a, an awful lot of influence between the two. That would make sense. OK, number three. So remember, put the number three at uh, the beginning of your guess. Um, so this is um, described as the, the, the that, excuse me, that should say the Paris and London fashions, not the parish. That's a typo on my, on my part. Now, um, when I had a look at this in the newspapers, it went into a lot of detail about each of the three people in this illustration. Um, so I've just described the one on the left. So this is the one that I've added in here. So we're talking we're talking about lavender colour satinette, a, a full skirt, a demi high corsage uh, with a black lace, something I can't pronounce. It really is very detailed, isn't it? It's um, it's it's the kind of information that we would just take in from a photograph now or from a moving image. But of course, they have to convey all that through the written word at that point. Absolutely. So what are we thinking, everybody? What decade is this illustration from based on the fashions? Uh, I'll just leave it a couple of moments to let you guess. And uh, then we will reveal the correct answer. Yes, I think we have a correct answer in the comments. Yes, here we go. Um, Victoria's got it. It's from the 1850s. In fact, it's from 1850. So why? What, what is it about this image that tells us that it is from this year? Uh, partly it's the hairstyle. So you've got the, um, often people refer to them as that kind of spaniel ears type hairstyle that comes down at the side. Um, partly the, uh, the the skirts that are quite tiered. You can just about see it was called a la disposition, which was a layered um, flouncy look to the skirts. You've got a shawl. Shawls are very popular mid 19th century. And then you've got the bonnet, which is absolutely uh, bonnets are very good at dating. Headwear is very good at date, helping to date the, um, the the ensemble more generally. So that's also part of it. Lovely. OK, let's move on. Uh, number four out of five, everybody. We've got this. So number four in front of your guesses for the decade for this image. 
It's a charming seaside frock introducing the kilted skirt of white serge. If I pronounced that right? Yeah. Um, with a cuirass. Yeah. Of so twelve, that's twelve the word. joy. So it's um, a cuirass is a is the the top half the bodice. Okay. The dress, um, and twelve de joy is well. It's interesting that because. Curious or Toile de Jouy. Toile de Jouy is a, a, a um, patterned, a French fabric that's like a printed, uh, a printed pattern that was really popular um, in the 18th century, particularly. But uh, you know, historicism, it's going back around. Okay, and I think this one may have also been too easy because um, we've got some correct guesses coming into the comments here. Let's find a correct one that I can show. Uh, Christine, the 1910s, yes. Well, 1909, so we'll, we'll accept that. Yes, 1909. Why 1909? Why this era? What, well, what's interesting about this period is it's the it's often called the Second Empire. So it's the it's just coming up to this directoire. So it's the end towards the end of the Edwardian period, and you're starting to see that emphasis on the bust going up slightly. So if you think about Titanic uh, from that movie, the costumes in that, it's a much slimmer silhouette. The um, the sleeves are very narrow. Uh, you've got lots of pin tucks and pleats that keep everything much, much, it's a much slimmer silhouette. But then you have that huge picture hat, which was often called a Merry Widow hat. So um, that's also distinctive of that particular decade as well. Brilliant. Okay, last one, everybody. Uh, so this is for number five. And we've got this lovely photograph here. And it's it's described as the highway of fashion. Something different for warm weather is the printed dress on the left from Debenham and Freebodies, Wigmore Street. It is cleverly cut with a basque effect reinforced with a pretty vest. It's from the Tatler, but what decade? So number five and then the decade. So what can you tell us about this one? Well, I think what's interesting here is that it's about uh, florals. So this particular era was really big on floral frocks. Uh, the, the, the hem, hems are always important. Hems will help you to, to uh, decide on particular decades. Um, and the fact that, that hats are still important, um, that dates it to, um, well, certainly it tells you that I think we all know that there's a point at which women stopped wearing hats. Um, and so that helps you to position it as well. Brilliant. Okay, lots of correct answers. I think I started off strong and then they just got easier. <laughs> but never mind. Uh, Margaret, you've got it. It's the 1940s. This is from 1943. Fantastic. So let us know how you did. Did you get full house? Did you get all five? Did you get a couple? Let us know. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove those now and we can carry on with our with our little chat. That was really good fun, actually. Thank you for that, Kate. Oh, it's nice. It's um, yeah, I've always loved actually when I worked in museums, I love the curators telling me, oh, look out for this detail because that tells you that this is when it when it um where where the date sits. And it's just that sort of it's often called hemline history is uh a really important part of understanding clothes I think. Yeah so if you've got you know a particular bit of clothing of one of your ancestors or you've got a photograph and you're not sure roughly when it, when this photograph or item clothing is from you can watch this session back so you don't have to watch it live like we are now you can actually watch it back on you, both YouTube and on Facebook and you can go back through all of these fantastic tips that Kate shared today. And also the previous chat that we had, and we've also had another fashion historian on as well. So definitely go back and watch those and take notes, everyone. Okay, so the next thing I wanted to chat about, when you were last on, you showed us this incredible dress diary that you'd come across. I was wondering if you could tell us where you are with it, I suppose, because yeah. I remember you were saying that you were doing a little bit of family history alongside it using some family history resources. So what can you tell us? Well, it's just been, it has been a really a, a journey of family history. The whole thing is, uh, so just briefly summarise where it, it was a book. I'm going to show it to you because I've got it here. Um, it was a book that I was given 
um, with no provenance, no information about it. It was a lady who had acquired it from a, a market stall in Camden in the 1960s. Um, this is the book. You can see how fat it is, um, covered in pink silk. And she knew nothing about it. It was just in a flea market. And I've spent the last, I acquired it in 2016, and I've spent the last 16 months writing about it. And I'm just going to show you a couple of pages, because this is what's inside. So it's just hundreds and hundreds. There's, in fact, about 2,000 um, scraps of fabric, dress material, sewn in, uh, pasted into this book. And above each one are captions that give a name, a year, um, sorry, it's just, hopefully you can sort of see. Yeah. Um, and I have spent the last 16 months finding out who kept it. And so I was able to do that. Um, I found out um, then there's over a hundred different names in the book. So what I've been spending my time doing is where possible identifying the people that have been named in the book and then finding out something about their lives mostly through things like census records um, through newspaper reports through um, parish registers and uh, so the whole thing particularly because of the pandemic was only possible because I was able to access those kinds of records and just found out all sorts of amazing stuff. And I wanted to show you, just to show you how important scraps are. So when I first got the book and I was going through it page by page, I'd just finished my book on Queen Alexandra. And I got to the back of the book uh, and tucked into the back, um, not stuck in, but tucked into the back was this piece of fabric. And I'll just show it to you. It's this sort of silk orange oh gorgeous. Figured silk and then it had this label pinned to it at the top and the label actually reads dress worn by Queen Alexandra it was given me in 1912 by her dressmaker's sister and so that was a point where I thought oh this is like serendipity I was supposed to have this book it was Absolutely. supposed to be uh, and it linked those two I was going from one really massive research project um, into this seemingly unrelated one and yet he is Alexandra um, tucked into the back of the book so I've just finished the way that the book is working um, it's 20 chapters and each chapter is a different person that features in the book and then a different theme attached to it so for example there's one of the names in the book is someone called Anna Kubra and when I was going through the census records I found that Anna Kubra was actually um, a friend, very close friend of the lady who kept the book, who's called Anne Sykes. Uh, and there were three pieces of cloth that said Anna Kubra's mourning clothes uh, for her mother, 1845. Um, so the chapter is about Anna and her life from the research I did in the records, but then it's also about 19th century mourning practices. So each chapter is a different person and a different theme. That's incredible. And which, um, I mean, it's, it's probably like picking a favourite child, but um, which <laughs> which of the people you researched um, was, I suppose, not necessarily your favourite, but most dear to your heart, I suppose? Well, Anne, Anne was very, Anne was born and brought up in Lancashire and lived near, uh, lived in Tilsley. She was born in Clitheroe and then moved to Tilsley as a child. But then I discovered that she actually traveled to Singapore and she and her husband lived for seven years in Singapore. So one of the most interesting scraps in the book is actually one that says, um, part of the pirate's flag captured by the Admiral in 1845. And I thought, hang on a minute, what's this? There's a pirate flag in here. Um, and when I, so when I then looked at that, I did discover it's actually um, somebody called Admiral Sir Thomas Cochrane, and he was on anti-piracy duties in the uh, around that part of the uh, around those seas around Singapore at that time and so Anne he was very famous in uh, certainly in Chilean folklore he became an admiral in the Chilean navy and helped to defeat the Spanish fleet so he's a bit of a legend there um, he's actually the inspiration for Hornblower and for uh, the Aubrey the Jack Aubrey series of books 
So he's this really, he's a bit of a folk hero in naval in the naval world. And there's this piece of, it looks very ordinary. It's just a piece of red, red wool. Um, but there it is, a piece of captured pirate flag. So I think that's probably the most intriguing piece in the book. That's incredible. And yes, I think it, for me, it comes back to what we were discussing earlier about us trying not to be hoarders and you know trying to make sure that you know everything that we've got we actually need whereas you've got that little scrap of fabric that had that not been kept uh -huh. that that connection wouldn't have been made and what's so interesting is Anne kept this book that she didn't have any children so then uh, after she died I uh you, uh got a copy of her will and all of her effects were uh the executors of her will were her two brothers so at some point they acquired this book after she died and then at some point after that she died in Bispam in near Blackpool so at some point after that it found its way to London but had it not been for her keeping all of these scraps in this seemingly really ephemeral kind of album then these are women whose stories otherwise wouldn't be told because they're ordinary women just living their lives in the middle of the 19th century they're not women who are um necessarily keeping diaries or they would just be lost and yet you have these these stories of of all of these lives just because she kept those those scraps so if you're watching at home everybody and you know your spouse for example has said to you you need to have a clear out you need to get rid of this album. You need to get rid of that scrapbook. Don't do it. <laughs> this is your this is your sign to keep hold of it, because <laughs> you never know. Exactly. Uh, hundred, two hundred years down the line, yeah. that might be the missing link for somebody. And exactly. I just think that's, that's so powerful. It really is. Remind me how you came across this um, the dress diary again. Well, I, I'm a lace maker and for years I started, started in my 20s making Honiton lace, which is a really fine uh, bobbin lace, British bobbin lace. And I went to, started going to a group in Devon where I live of, of lace makers and occasionally gave talks to the group because they knew what I did for a job. And after one of the talks, a lady... Uh, one of the ladies, elderly lady called Francine, uh, said, oh, I'm, I'm clearing out my flat and I don't know what to do with, with lots of stuff and would you like to come and have a look? And um, it turned out that she had actually worked in the theatre. She'd been the wardrobe, uh, wardrobe mistress of the National Theatre in the 1960s and so she'd acquired all of this stuff. She had boxes and boxes of dress patterns from the 1940s all the way through to the 80s she had garments she had all sorts of things and a lot of a lot of it i actually gave to our archive at Falmouth university because we're building this teaching collection for students um but right at the bottom of the trunk was this this thing wrapped in brown paper and that's what it turned out to be and she didn't know what it she didn't know where where it uh, other than that it had come from this flea market she didn't know anything else about it and it is very rare there are a few of these in America I have found some in collections around the United States maybe six or seven but I haven't found there's there's only one other book in the V&A in London which is called Barbara Johnson's album that was kept in the 18th century uh, that's one of their treasures because it's because it is so rare. There isn't really. I haven't found another one like it in in the UK. It's just. It almost reminds me of if you end up going to a, a an antique shop or um, like a jumble sale, a car boot sale, anything like that. And you know, some of the, some of the things that you can find there are, are, are real, real his, little historical treasures. And I, there's, a, there's an author I follow on Instagram and she was putting some, some things about on, uh, on, her, in, uh, on her stories of things that her dad had, had found and I think had come across at a jumble sale or something. And they were the, sort of a collection of photographs from I think sort of the 1920s, 1930s, and like other things like postcards. 
And I messaged this author and I absolutely I love this author. I've never spoken to her before in my life. But I said, um, have you actually managed to trace have you managed to trace who she is, um, this woman, and uh, you know, maybe living descendants? I work in family history, so that's immediately what my mind goes to. And she was like, no, but I do really want to do it. So I'm actually considering messaging her back and going, give me the details, I'll help. Yeah, come on. <laughs> Just because my curiosity. So intriguing. Yes. Um, Georgia saying, husband or family history folders, no contest. <laughs> Beth saying, I love making bobbin lace as well. I need to get back to lace making. Very meditative. Okay, um, the next thing I wanted to chat about before, because I've just realised it's 10 to the hour. Um, you had some examples of resources that you've mm. been using for, di for different fashion trends, I suppose, yeah. that you'd like to share. There were just a couple of things. It was really just a way that to show you that objects can be really important and even so for example someone gave me this recently which which you'd think oh someone could throw that out but it's actually it just turned up in someone's attic and it's um it's quite old it's glazed cotton and it is the it's the inside of a of a muff oh yeah um and somebody just kept that in their attic. And actually, it's a really important part of dress history. But also, you can see where they sewed, filled it up with feathers. And then they've done a really, really, oh, hang on, really lovely, neat sewing up the opening there. Um, so even things like that are really important to keep as um, as records of um, of social history and of the way people um, dressed. The other thing that I use a lot, because you can get them on eBay, I use this a lot in my research, are things like photographs and carte de visite. So if you're wanting to, if you've got some family photographs and you're not sure how to date them, sometimes finding other examples on. So when I was doing my Alexandra research, I bought a lot of these little um, things like these stereoscope, uh, stereoscopic cards on eBay just for a few pounds because that's Alexandra here and you can see this is from the oh, yeah. she's got a crinoline on and often when objects don't survive anymore they're only they might just be a pound or two on eBay but it helped me for example none of her tailored garments actually survive anymore so it's only through things like these postcards original postcards that you can actually um, date them because often they will come with a date as well um, and so I use those, even things like these lovely little cabinet cards. Um, they're really, it's worth looking at things like eBay to, to find those kind of images. Also, just don't discard. Um, this was given to me by a friend recently. This is a piece of her family history. So it just looks like an old exercise book with this marble cover. Um it's the kind of thing that could easily get cleared out by accident. But actually, when I opened it, look at this. It is um, <gasps> from the Regency. It's this lady who draw, uh, drew little watercolours of these dresses and then described them underneath. Wow. They're absolutely beautiful. Um, That's extraordinary. Somebody called Mrs Fanning, who lived at 32 Campton Hill Gardens in Kensington. Um and then on each page, so this is from 1806, and it says that it's um, a, a la ladies in the most fashionable winter walking dress. And look at that. It's a, this brilliant sort of fur trimmed um, or feather trimmed thing. So it's, I think it's really important not to always check. You never know what something might be. Just these these secret hidden things um and i also use sometimes you can get a complete record so this is something that just was given to me this week to give to our collection it's a box nice sort of paper covered box and inside are all the documents it's so it's a whole it's a dozen um handkerchiefs that are still in their original box they've never been used They've got the original care instructions here. It's called Hannah and Co. And it's Silkalon, which is this, um, obviously, this sort of faux silk fabric from, and I think it's the 1940s, but it's got um, hand embroidered 
initials oh, yeah. rw so you never know that company is still going and i'm thinking well if you could get in touch with the company oh, they might have records might know who rw is um so i think it's about particularly with objects that they can be they can be useful they're obviously Photographs and images um, are really important. I use them a lot. And I think it's just that objects can be just equally uh, revealing, even if you don't necessarily know a lot about them, but they can um, they can speak for themselves. If you're interested, there's a good book called The Dress Detective, um, which is this idea of how can we how can we look at a garment and make it speak to us when we don't necessarily know anything about the wearer? um so that's if anyone's interested it's an int it's a, it's a really good sort of introduction to this idea of um of clothes telling stories i think it's given us a, a lot to think about <laughs> wouldn't you agree everybody um you know it's got a lot of people talking in the comments um uh, beth saying we've got photos from about 1910 onwards thankfully thankfully we can roughly date by the people um Kim saying, I found my relative's portraits at a barn sale that my daughter took me to. They were tossed aside free. Oh, my goodness. Oh, no. And repurposed the frames. Yeah. Uh, Tony saying, I did a huge clear out 18 years ago when I moved. Never again. Never moving again. Never, never having the clear out again. Right. I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> Um, anyway, let's see if we can squeeze in a couple of extra questions before we finish up. Um, just scrolling back up now, see if I can find questions. What treasures have you uncovered in a pocket or lining of an old garment? Oh, that's a really good, that's one of the first things I learned when I started out as a young curator, which is um, always check the pockets uh, because you never know. What you might find and the same thing if we were given bags or um bags or purses always always check so sometimes um you would find things like the bill for the original garment the like the receipt and that's always really interesting because you get an idea of how much it cost and and where they got it from if it doesn't happen to have a, 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 a maker's label inside it um I always wanted to find like a love letter or something you know, in a purse, but I never, I never have yet. Maybe it's still out there, but um, yes, that was always my 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 mentor uh, said always check the pockets. That's important. Um, we've got Lynn here asking about sources for nineteenth-century men's fashions, and or might we send in suspected mid-century photographs for a future session? There's, some people have said this; um, they would like to be able to submit photos, and you could maybe give them a bit of a helping hand. Of course, I'm always I'm really happy for for you to do that. It's absolutely fine. Um, sources for nineteenth-century men's fashions. Um, there's a there was a if you're interested in ordering it from the library, there's a book called Reigning Men, R-E-I-G-N, Reigning Men, uh, that's about menswear. Um, there's also a really good book uh, called Men in Black, um, which is all about the history of menswear. Um, but also things like uh, museum websites are so good. So the Met Museum in New York, their database of historic dresses the biggest in the world so it's all online um and then there are things like the museum at fit in new york they have got something called the fit fashion timeline and they do a decade by decade analysis of women's wear men's wear children's wear uh, so that's also a, a good source amazing lots of food for thought for all of us i think today um I think that's about all we've got time for because we're at the top of the hour now and I'm sure you're all wanting to get on with uh, with what you've got to do this evening or for the rest of your day. Kate, it's been an absolute pleasure. I, I don't know where the time goes. I could just carry on nattering. Me too. It's so nice. Um, thank you to everyone for coming along. It's been lovely to to chat with you and answer questions. So, yeah, thank you. 
We've had some excellent questions today. Um, so thank you everybody for taking the time to, to tune in and to chat with us. A uh, couple of bits of housekeeping before we finish up. So um, Miko is back on Friday for Fridays Live. Uh, we have another returning guest next week. Um, I think House History will announce who it is on Monday. And remember, we've got free British census records on Find My Past from 10 a.m. on Friday to 10 a.m. on Monday. So tell your friends, everybody. It's time to dig into some family history, to some house history, to some local history, maybe even some fashion history if you want to take a trip into the newspapers as well. So yes, uh, thank you, everybody. It's been a, an absolute pleasure. And uh, I think we'll leave it there. So have a lovely afternoon, everybody and take care of yourselves. Bye. Bye.